tell that good church and people are so friendly. And that goes that goes a long way. I was just thinking about it as I was my message this morning is as long as I've been preaching, I still have a fear when I stand up to preach. I heard a story one time about a young man that was I guess he had that fear too, and he was sitting in a chair, something similar to this, and there was a knot hole in the wood here, and he had his sermon, and he would push it in, and pull it out, and play with it, and all of a sudden it fell in. And he, he would get out of preach, he told him, he said, you know, the best message you've probably ever heard is in that knot hole right there. <laughs> I don't know about my message, but uh, if you have your Bibles with you this morning, I want you to turn to Galatians, the sixth chapter, verses one and two. Galatians, the sixth chapter, verses one and two. Galatians six, verses one and two. This is Paul speaking here. He says, Brethren, if a man be overtaken in a fall, ye which are spiritual, restore such a one in the spirit of meekness, considering thyself, lest thou also be tempted. Bear ye, bear ye one another's burdens, and so fulfill the law of Christ. Let's go to the Lord and pray. Father, we thank you for your word, Lord God. Father, because we know every word in this Bible is true. The word says you're not a man that you should lie. And Father, we come together this morning, Father, just praising you. And Father, just stand with uplifted hands, Father, just thanking you, Father, for allowing your son Jesus Christ to die in our place. Father, he took our sins our deeds, and he forgave them. Father, the Bible says he cast them as far as the east was from the west. He cast them to the sea of forgetfulness. And Father, we thank you so much for that, Lord God. Did he loved us first. And Father, we thank you, Lord God, for everyone that's here this morning. Just ask that you bless each family that's represented here, Father. And just, I pray that you might be glorified this morning. And Father, I pray that your precious Holy Spirit, Father, has the freedom this morning to touch people's hearts. That people might be set free, Lord God. That the chains might fall off of people's arms and legs this morning. And Father, we're going to give you the glory. In Jesus Christ's name we pray. Amen. I, uh, I take preaching very serious. And I sought the Lord ever since the Lord asked me about preaching. And I took notes and I took notes and I took notes. And this is what the Lord gave me to preach this morning. And it goes back to these two verses. And I want to ask you this morning, do you personally know someone that used to walk with the Lord but they're not close to anymore? Personally, do you, do you have a friend? Do you have a relative? Do you know someone that one that used to have a relationship with Jesus Christ and now they don't even want to hear the name? Maybe they used to sit on the same pew that you sit on. Maybe they even rode to church with you in your car. Maybe they were in Sunday school with you, but now they've been ambushed by the devil and they've fallen into sin, and they're broken. They're a broken person, they're in bondage, and they're in guilt. And that bondage and guilt is destroying them. Possibly that person loved the Lord at one time. Loved Him with all their heart. And now, 
They are broken brother and sister. Not like I asked. I'm sure that some, that some people here this morning know people that are in that situation this morning. They're broken. And you ask them, you say, well, how you doing? And they'll put on the biggest smile and say, well, I'm fine. To me, people in church would be quicker to get an Academy Award than a movie star. We're good about lying and putting on face, oh, everything's fine. And you know inside their hearts are crazy. Because they left the Lord, they don't have that relationship they once had. Now the scripture that I read this morning is about God giving us a ministry. This isn't just something Paul got off the top of his head. This is about giving us a ministry to restore those people. Galatians 6 1 says, We're to restore such a one. Then Paul went on to say, He said, Considering thyself. What's he mean by considering thyself? It could happen to you. That very thing that happened to that soul that's not here anymore, it can happen to you because it consider yourself because it could happen to you. So don't be too quick to point a finger. I studied up what the word restore means. Restore carries the definition of setting a broken bone. Someone's got a broken bone and it's never been set. It also refers to mending a net. Holes being in a net. And we mend those holes in that net. It means to restore, to put back so it can be used again. That's our job. As Christian brothers and sisters, we're to restore those that are not here anymore. We're to restore those that aren't close to Christ anymore. You see, a lot of our brothers and sisters are hurt. They're wounded and they have broken hearts. They're spiritually broken. And you can't see it in a lot of cases. In a lot of cases, you can, but they don't strike out on anger. But in a lot of cases, they just carry that hurt inside. And you never know it. These areas in their lives that have bones have never been reset. They've never been restored. I was reading this, and it says in Proverbs 18 9, he said, A brother offended is harder to, to win than a, than a walled city. And when these brothers and sisters get offended, they begin to put up walls around them. He said, you're harder to win back than an army trying to take a wall city. Or it's like a gate between you and your friends. The Marines have a motto. And this is their motto. We never leave anybody behind. But the church... This is what was commented about the church. It's the only army in the world that kills its wounded or leaves them on the battlefield. It's not anything to be proud of, is it? We kill our wounded or we leave them on the battleground. Does this statement Remind you of what believers do? It does me. I've seen it too many times. When people stumble or trip or fall, first thing we want to do is criticize them. We're quick to risk them, to, 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 to ridicule them. And we're not too fast about bringing them back. We're quick to give them a lecture. Well, you should have done this, you should have done that. We're good at lecturing. We're also good at ignoring them. We berate them. In a lot of cases, we just disown them. 
We don't even consider them brothers or sisters anymore. So Paul is, is telling us when a brother or sister is overtaken in sin or some fault, we are to restore them. That's our job as a church. There's more to being a believer than just coming on Sunday morning and, and singing songs, praying, maybe visitation once a week or ever, or Wednesday night service. I, we are to restore those that are hurt. <clears throat> We're to fix them. We're to mend them, heal them. We're to set those broken bones that they have in their lives. I want you to remember this if you don't remember nothing else. You can't look down your nose at anyone if you're on your knees. <coughs> if you're on your knees, you can't look down at anyone. <coughs> Galatians 5, 4 tells us, he said, for the law, the law is fulfilled in this word, even this, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. I want to clear something up this morning. Paul is not talking about an unbeliever. He's not talking about an unbeliever where sin is a way of life. He's not talking to somebody that's never been redeemed. He's dealing with born-again believers that have failed, that have stumbled, and he says, restore them. They're blood-bought children of God just like you are, only they trip, they fail. Let me tell you something. If you're a Christian, you've got a target on your back. Satan wants to destroy you. He wants to see you fall flat on your face. It's a believer that is stumbling and failed. And don't think it can't happen to you. The right circumstances that it can happen to you, you can fall flat on your face. One thing about God's Word, when the Lord paints a picture in His Bible, He shows warts and all. He don't hold anything back. I want us to look at just a few examples this morning of people that have fallen and the Lord restored them. Think about Moses. The Bible calls him Moses the lawgiver. And Moses was a spiritual man. Moses loved the Lord. He was so loved by God that only him and Elijah was, met with Jesus Christ on the Mount of Transfiguration. That's how close he was to the Lord. Yet there was a time in Moses' life when he ran from the Lord. He started out to be a missionary and he ended up a murderer. He spent 40 years on the backside of a mountain tending his father-in-law's sheep. God restored him. God restored him. Let's look at Simon Peter, the mighty apostle. Jesus loved Peter, and Peter loved Jesus. But there came a barren time, even in Peter's life, as close as he was to Jesus Christ. There came a barren time in his life. Not only was it a barren time, he swore and denied Christ. He said, I never knew him. Can you imagine what a field day the gossips had with people? Just think about what a field day they had. I can hear them now. Oh, Reverend Peter, the rock. Ain't that a joke? I never had any confidence in him anyway. I always thought he'd fall flat on his face. He was always running off at the mouth how much he would defend his master. Now look at him. He's already denied him three times in one night. You know what? He's a hypocrite. The rock. The rock. He was nothing but talk. 
I'm finished with you. I'm finished with him. Talk is cheap. But you know what? Christ wasn't finished with him. Christ was not finished with him. You think about it. He's the same Peter that on the day of Pentecost preached the gospel and 3,000 people were saved in one sermon. He's the same one that they would lay people out in the street just to be shattered to go across them that they might be healed. Yeah, he had troubles. He backslid. He fell on his face. He denied the Lord, and the Lord wooed him back to him. He restored him, and that's what we're to be doing. If Christ can do it, we can do it. We're to be chopped. We're to be Christ-like. Look at King David. The Bible says that King David was a man after God's own heart. He was called a sweet singer of Israel. David loved the Lord. Yet there was a time in David's life when he was trapped and he failed. Probably no one in the Bible has ever felt any harder than David did. He became entangled with lust. After lust, then he had murder, cheating, lying, and he disgraced his God. But he redeemed it. Would we have given up on him? What would we have done if we'd have been the people that are the Israelites there? We'd have gave up on him. We'd have turned our back on him. But God didn't turn his back on him. We're too quick to give up on people. God set those broken bones up for David. God restored David. And he said that there'd always be a member of David's family on the throne forever. That's what he thought of David. And at the end of David's life, he was still serving God. Did he slip? Did he fall? He did. But God set those broken bones. I thank God for the ministry of restoration. Because at one time or another, each one of us has got out of God's will. Amen? We have gotten out of God's will. I'm not going to ask for a show of hands. It's, I dare not. But we have gotten out of God's will. You see, the ministry of restoration is second only to our ministry of salvation of soul winning. That's, how, that's the important God puts on, puts on it. It is second to soul winning. When a brother or sister falls, what do we do? A lot of times we're quick to say, oh, that ain't none of my business. I keep my hands off of that. That's none of my business. Restoration, people, is a ministry of every believer. It, restoration is not just for a few. It ain't just for chosen. If you're a Christian, Restoration is part of your ministry. Yet we want to shun it. We want to get away from it. But it is part of your ministry. And if you're shunning it, there's something wrong. Let me say this. If you don't care for this ministry, you've already declared yourself unspiritual. I need to duck. If you don't care for restoration, you've already declared yourself unspiritual. There's something lacking in your life if you say you're a Christian and you don't care about others. Listen to what God's Word says. Ye which are spiritual, restore such a one in the spirit of meekness. The Lord said that. Ye which are spiritual, restore them. You don't run from them. You don't point fingers, but you restore them. They say, a manner to restore. There's a certain manner to restore people. And Paul speaks about three truths about the manner of restoration. First, he said it must be done gently. If a person's been hurt, remember I said I said they got they got broken bones. You don't see them, but it's there. He said you've got to restore them gently. It ain't like 
You, you don't pick up a baby and just throw it over your shoulder. You hold that baby gently. You caress that baby. It'd be like Boyd when he went out to a wreck or something there and he, he suspects somebody's got a broke dick or there's a rib sticking through the, the side of their body. You, you treat them gently. You secure that neck, you secure that wound, you do whatever you do, but you, you do it gently. And that's what Paul says. We're to restore him gentleness. The last thing that our, that our hurt and our broken brother or sister needs is someone with a condemning spirit. They don't need some critical person coming to them and getting in their face. You should have done this. You should have done that. I read a story several years ago. And it's very relevant to what I'm preaching about this morning. It said there was a teenage girl. And she was overheard talking in the hall of school one day about a moral difficulty she was having in her life. <coughs> Something was going on in her life. And this is what she said. If I get into trouble, the people down at the church would be the last people on earth I want to know about. Wow. The people down at the church would be the last people I would ever want to know about. People, that's a tragic commentary. The people down at the church ought to be the very first ones you could go to. But we prove ourselves that we can't be trusted. We prove ourselves that we're not the very ones they're going to come to. A young girl in trouble, she needs to be able to come to her church body. A young man that's got out of God's will, he needs to be able to come to the church body. And we ought to love them and bring them back into fellowship. We need to be about the business of restoration. This is what I always thought church was. If you've got something to laugh about, I'm going to laugh with you. And I, and I enjoy that. But if you've got something to cry about your spirit, then I'm going to cry with you. That's the way it is with the church people. If a brother or sister's got something to cry about, rejoice with them. I'm going to laugh about it. Rejoice with them. But if they got something to cry more about, we cry with them. We don't cast them out. We don't kick them to the side. We don't pour fingers. We don't admonish them. We love them. That's the way you bring them back into the family of God. You love them back into the family of God. The second of my restoration, would you restore a broken spirit gently and with a humble spirit? Believe it or not, people, you said here this morning, there could come a time in your life when you need this ministry. Don't say it can't happen. It can happen. It might be a time in your life when you need this ministry, when you need somebody just to put an arm around you and tell them they love you. Paul said in 1 Corinthians 10, 12, let him that thinketh he stand take heed lest he fall. This is a good verse to remember. If you think you stand, if you think you can stand, and you're never going to fall, you're wrong. Psalms 91, verse 3. I, I, I love Psalms 91. I've been doing it every day for probably 30 years. But in verse 3, it talks about traps. It talks about snares and people falling into them. And the most of the people that get caught up in snares or traps, the, the only reason, I won't say the only reason, but the most of the reason they get caught up in them is because they're hurting. That's what drives people to snaps and to trap and snares, because they're hurting people. And we need to do everything we can do to, to take that hurt from them. There's three people sitting where you're sitting this morning. There's three people sitting identical where you're at this morning, sitting in the same pew you're in this morning. Three of them. One of the persons is the person you are right now. You're sitting there. Person you are right now. 
Then there's the person, secondly, that has a, a potential for the Lord to use and do great and mighty things. And thirdly, there's also the broken person who can fall into sin at any time. That's the three people. That's the three people that's sitting right where you're sitting this morning. Don't say it, Dad. We don't seem to recognize the potential for sin in our lives. I can say this much. Flesh is still flesh. Flesh is still flesh. And I don't think we, we realize the potential for sin in our lives. There's the law of the Spirit that lifts us up. But there's also the, a law of sin and death that drags us down. And that's what happens to so many of us. We get drugged down and there's nobody there to help us get back up. We don't realize just how filthy and foul our flesh is. Even if you've been saved 50, 60, 70 years, flesh is still flesh. There's a potential for sin. I don't care how close you are with the Lord, there's a potential for sin in your life. Can you see that flesh is not subject to the laws of God? So what is sin? I'm going to give you my definition of what sin is. It's a built-in weakness that we all have. A built-in weakness that we have. Built in weakness plus an opportunity. That's all we need. The, 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 the flesh is there, so all we need is an opportunity. And you know what we'll do? We'll take that opportunity and we'll sin. And a proud person, they already have a target on their back. Don't say that you can't fall, people. <coughs> It's in your DNA. It was in our forefathers' DNA. Adam and Eve. We're all children. We're all descendants of Adam and Eve. We're subject to sin. We're flesh and blood. And we all need a humble spirit. And we all need that ministry in our life where we're, where we're restoring broken brothers and sisters. Jesus reminded us, he said, Blessed are the merciful. Well, they shall obtain mercy. You want mercy in your life? Then give mercy. Jesus himself said that. The next one, you might be him as for her that's needing mercy. So always be merciful. And third, he says, you should restore him or her gently, humbly, and sympathetically. Now the word burden. It was you to take the burden off of it. That word burden means an oppressive weight. It refers to a person, a burden that a person's got he can't carry. She can't carry it any longer. That's a burden. Something so heavy in their life, something that's dragging them down. He says, we're to take that burden from them. We're to restore them. When the Lord saved us, people, he didn't fix us up so we never sin again. I don't care how good a Christian you are. He didn't fix us up so we would never sin again. We're flesh and blood, and we sin. The most miserable person on this earth is not an unbeliever. But it's a saved person out of fellowship with Christ. That's the most miserable person in the world. It's the same person that's out of fellowship with Christ. The law of Moses had ten commandments, but the law of Christ has only one. He loved us, so we ought to love one another. We ought to love one another. He loved us, so we ought to love one another. Ephesians 4.32 says, and be ye kind one to another, 
tenderhearted, forgiving one another, even as God for Christ's sake has forgiven you. He said, Christ has forgiven you, you child, like you're a child of God. Can't you forgive? So many people hurt, so many people have left the church, and we haven't tried to win them back. At the beginning of my message, I spoke about restoration as someone mending a hole in a net, a fisher's net. It's like Peter and James and, jo and James used to throw out and catch fish. He said, he said, they got net, he said, but there's holes in it. Can I tell you this morning that there's many fish going through those holes in those nets? I'm talking about people. The nets in our lives have holes on them. And a lot of people are going through those holes. And we need to be bringing back to Christ. People, these fish that are going through those holes in those nets are brothers and sisters. The only thing I say in closing is God help us to be vendors of the nets. Jesus name. Amen. If you don't know Jesus Christ, you're saying this morning. There's an opportunity for you to come this morning and make Jesus go in your life. Maybe there's just something unprofessional in your life. Maybe you've got baggage that you didn't need to get rid of this morning. This is a perfect place to lay it down. Whatever the need in your life this morning is, Jesus Christ will meet you here. He'll meet those needs. He'll repair that net. He'll repair those broken bones. <clears throat> Come this morning. Amen.